look after the research and technology strategy for Jaguar Land Rover. In short, um, I'm expected to advise on the technology big bets, and then uh, when they don't quite come to fruition, I have to explain why not. What I'd like to do uh, for the next 10 minutes is share some of the challenges why we don't have fully autonomous vehicles today. Uh, I use the word fully autonomous carefully. Um, there is some of the challenges there. There are many others. For example, I could uh, full connectivity. It's, it's certainly a requirement. I could add uh, data security. Another but given 10 minutes, I've just decided to uh, focus on, on these small numbers here. Um, as you can see from the picture, autonomous cars is not a new concept. Back in the 1950s, uh, engineers were thinking of uh, autonomy. Um, we're still not there, and I think we have still some way to come. So if the uh, question you're burning to ask is when will we see the world's first truly fully autonomous car? The answer is when we solve all these challenges, which I'll try and outline for you briefly now. The other message I'd like you to take away is that the industry is making incremental steps. That's the important thing that you should be aware of. There are incremental steps. There is no magic breakthrough. Google haven't come up with a magic technological breakthrough. They're all a collection of incremental steps. So I'll run through these briefly. <coughs> but before I do, um, these are some of the reasons why automotive companies and other companies, for that matter, are striving to develop autonomous cars. Some of them, I would argue, are a little stretched. Um, some of them are very genuine uh, benefits. But in most papers you read, you would tease out some of these key points as to why the industry is striving for autonomous vehicles. I won't dwell on the benefits, but that is the driver that's forcing companies like us and many others to develop autonomous cars. OK, autonomous <coughs> cars are fantastic. It would be great to be able to sit in a car in the morning, tell the car I want to go to work and use that very valuable time to clear some of my inbox, which I never managed to succeed. That would be fantastic. However, I think we should be mindful if I was in that car, on that road, the last thing I would probably want <laughs> is an autonomous car. Um, so we do have to make sure that we keep reality here and we keep a check on what's happening with the sector. So I'm a firm believer, and I hope I'm not alone, that if, if many of you were in that car on that road, I don't think you'd want to predict in your autonomous mode. I think you'd want to see what that car can do, and you'd want to feel it. Um, I certainly would. Um, so that's one aspect, and uh, people tell us, um, if you do an autonomous car, we still need to be able to do that. We also get told this. Can you really trust a machine? We have developed a whole suite of what I would call highly automated features, whereby the vehicle is taking longitudinal control, that is control of the acceleration and braking, and lateral control, that is where the car takes control of the steering. Today on the market, you can't have both, you can only have one. Um, but we've shown and done some well, many user trials on test tracks under controlled conditions where we have a car pulling out to overtake another. Meanwhile, in the outside lane is another car that's coming very fast. If the driver did continue with that maneuver, there would be a collision. So in test, we demonstrate that we can take control of the steering wheel and put that car back in lane. You're basically forcing control away from the driver. It actually saves the driver's lives. When we say to customers, do you like that? The majority say, no, I do not like that. I have a feeling that I have lost control. So driver acceptance is critical. And it is going to take quite some time 
before everybody in this room is happy to get into a car and take your feet off the pedals and your hands off the wheel. We're all different, but it is going to take some time, and the word trust is going to be key in that. Major challenge for us, that's one. <coughs> Just going on from driver acceptance, it is our view that any product that we do offer in the future should be able to do both. If you want to be autonomous for specific features under specific conditions, you should be allowed to do so. If you want a more engaging drive, again, you should be allowed to do so. I think that is much more realistic as a target to achieve than a truly, fully autonomous car. That is what we are working to, to develop. So to develop that, what do we need? Um, well, we have a vehicle and it is literally covered in sensors. We've got forward-facing cameras, we've got rear-facing cameras, we've got forward-facing radars, rear-facing radars, we've got ultrasonic sensors, etc., etc. On top of that, we've got, um, if you want true autonomy, you need 3D landscaping. You've probably all seen the, the bubble on top of the uh, Google car. That's a LiDAR to achieve 3D landscaping. You need vehicle-to-vehicle, vehicle-to-infrastructure communications. And you probably also uh, could argue that you need eHorizon, which is not just basic navigation data, but it's about r road contours, road curvature. So you need all of this sensing data. And to be truly, fully autonomous, all of that has to work in unison, and all of that has got to work under all conditions. And most of you know, if you have a reversing camera on the morning, when it's all misted up, you can't actually see. So just a simple thing like <coughs> a camera, it doesn't work under all conditions. When it does, it's brilliant. So you have to have things like uh, radars to back that up, or you go for redundancy. So just the sensing challenge alone is enormous. When you fit a car with all these sensors, the cost shoots up enormously. The bubble on top of the Google car, <coughs> two or three years ago, that's a 64-channel LiDAR. Two or three years ago, that cost about fifty to $60,000 just for that little bubble on the top. So you have to ask, are people really going to be prepared to pay for that for a few automated features? The cost of that has come down considerably. You can buy something that will do a similar thing, a 16-channel one now, typically around the $8,000 mark. But th the cost, as well as the sense of performance, are major challenges that equally have to be uh, overcome. This is probably <coughs> as difficult. Sense of fusion. Any autonomous car needs to have a full understanding of what the state of the vehicle is. What's the steering wheel angle? What's the speed? Um, everything about the vehicle has to be known. We also have to understand the outside environment. Is it night? Is it day? Is it hot? Is it freezing? Um, we have to understand that. And we also have to understand what exactly is the driver doing? Because at any point, one of those sensors could fail, and you may have to hand control back to the driver. So you need to understand what the driver's doing. So the center point, the sensor fusion point, is where the software engineers tend to spend most of their time. Trying to write code that brings all them together to make a truly autonomous functionality. So as I put at the bottom there, sensor fusion is highly complex but critical to successful autonomy. Validation, I would say this is probably, <coughs> if you said to me what's the single most difficult aspect of autonomy, I would say validation. If you've got an empty road, with very clear, defined white lines and no traffic, it's fairly simple to do an autonomous car. If then you move on and, it, again, it's truly autonomous, you've got manual signage, you know, things like stop, go, and you've got that in many, many countries in the world. An autonomous car faced with that challenge today would struggle. If you move on from that, you've got complex hand signage where police or others are directing traffic. Again, if we're talking about a truly autonomous car, it has to be able to deal with that. If you take the top right, somewhere a software engineer 
has got to program the logic that says, when I'm in that scenario, this is what you do. <laughs> yeah? It's, it's a long, long time away from truly fully autonomous um, functionality to achieve that. What is imminent is a series of incremental fully autonomous features for specific circumstances under specific conditions. And that's what you're seeing in, in most of the media. But validation is really, really difficult. And software engineers will argue, and some will say, well, we'll work through every single scenario that could possibly happen. I would argue that's impossible. You're talking about millions and millions and millions of scenarios. It's just not doable. So others would argue, OK, you don't do that. What you do is you create a set of rules. And we will program to a set of rules. When you program to a set of rules, <coughs> it's probably true. You can simplify some of the software. But again, you've got to think of all the scenarios that could happen. For example, is the programmer going to think of the rule that says, when the car is driving along this road at 30 miles an hour, a dog runs out onto the road from this side and a cat from this side. The car is going to hit one of them. So which of the software engineer decided it's going to hit? <laughs> yeah. the, the, the scenarios and the rules are extremely difficult. So my argument is we will see these incremental improvements towards autonomy. The challenges are enormous. Um, there is a third category of uh, programmer that will tell you you don't do scenarios, you don't do rules, you do machine learning. You use big data, data analytics, and what you do is monitor how the driver drives. And after a while, the machine is sufficiently intelligent and it can drive autonomously. I believe the answer is actually a, probably a combination of all three. Somewhere or other within the software, you have a combination of all three. But validation is the key to true full autonomy. It will be solved, <coughs> but it's some way off. So I argue it's incremental steps. Um, and those incremental steps started quite some time ago with automatic cruise control. Um, they are progressing along that axis. Um, the industry will no doubt uh, get there. Um, it's come at it from two ends. Today, where we are principally with most manufacturers, that I would argue they have semi-autonomous features. So at the one end, if we talk about slow driving, it's principally to do with parking. And with parking semi-autonomous features, what the driver does is actually relinquish lateral control. That's the hard bit, the steering. So the driver relinquishes lateral control, but he retains longitudinal control because that's legal and we can do that. And it's all about convenience. And it's all about letting technology do what some drivers don't want to do. And it does it very well. At the other end of the spectrum, at high speed, you've actually got the reverse. At high speed, we relinquish longitudinal control. So we give up the acceleration and braking to the machine, but we retain lateral control. It's actually the reverse. And what will happen over time <coughs> is that these two will converge with a whole series of features that we'll put in our brochures and hopefully you'll buy. And these features will build and build and build over time, and eventually they'll converge. Then we're starting to get very close to a truly <coughs> autonomous car. So within the industry, we have something called the DEST level, which is the different levels of autonomy. Here, down at the bottom, assisted. They are your semi-autonomous features. These are where you give uh, control to the vehicle. This is your longitudinal control. This is your lateral control. So lateral, you're giving park assist. Longitudinal, it's cruise control. And the industry will be working up through there. Um, and, and that's effectively what, what is happening and what eventually will get to there, where there are enough features that can do both longitudinal and lateral control. You add them together, and in most scenarios, they will <coughs> allow you to stitch them together. Today, what we see is autonomous cars driving onto a highway, starting the mileage clock, 
and then trying to build up that bank of miles, principally to get the learning. The minute it comes off of the motorway, it gets a bit more difficult, unless you're in very slow controlled environment, like parking, like something called traffic jam assist or traffic jam pilot, where you're literally just nudging forward a few meters at a time. Again, it's about convenience at slow speed. It's about safety at high speed. So last slide, <clears throat> this is just a breakthrough of um, taking one slice of customer feature. This slice is about parking. So I mentioned uh, level one, it's about semi-autonomy. It's about handing over lateral control to the car. Most um, offerings by most premium OEMs today that self-park themselves will allow you to basically take your hands off the wheel. However, technically, most of them need reference points. For autonomy and the vehicle and control, you need reference points. So they only typically work when you have a car either side of you, whether it's parallel parking or perpendicular, because those cars are actually used as sensor reference points. If those cars are removed, it becomes a bit harder. We then have to rely on white lines. Therefore, we have to fit the car with full 360 cameras. And that will happen, and is happening. And then if you go beyond the white lines, if you say to an autonomous car, here is an empty car park, and you take away all the cars and all the white lines, it should be the easiest thing in the world to park. Unfortunately, there's no reference points, so it's quite difficult. So the whole raft of parking goes along this level where we will get to what I would call valet or autonomous parking, where you can realistically or plausibly see that you could enter a multi-story car park. One of the floors of that multi-story car park could be dedicated to autonomous vehicles, where there are no people and only maybe one vehicle is allowed to be moving at any one point. You could drop your car off. You could then press a button on your smartphone that says, go find me a space. It would go to that floor and find a space. When you finish your shopping, you could press your button and recall your car. It would be a very specific, controlled environment for a fully autonomous feature. Quite realistic, quite technically plausible too. So what we're going to see with parking is from the one hand that we've got today, right through to the scenario I've just described. Okay, that's probably more than my time, so with that, I'll thank you.